Are yes, you able to see my slides? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for confirming. Okay, so here is a brief um, outline for my talk. I will provide some background information on antimicrobial resistance and tell you about the objectives for this research, discuss our methods, results, and conclusions drawn based on our findings and provide some recommendations as well as acknowledge our funders and collaborators. Escherichia coli, also known as E. coli, is an important zoonotic foodborne pathogen worldwide. This gram-negative bacteria, which resides in the guts of warm-blooded animals and humans, was discovered in 1885 by Theodor Escherich, a German pediatrician. E. coli can be isolated from food, water, soil, animals, amongst others. Antimicrobial resistance is a global concern. This slide shows the annual death rates attributable to AMR when compared to other major causes of death. The World Health Organization declared that antimicrobial resistance is even a bigger crisis than AIDS. Current estimates show that AMR accounted for 700,000 deaths globally, but it has been estimated that by 2050, the number of deaths attributable to AMR will rise to 10 million annually if nothing is done, and 40% of these deaths will occur in Africa. When antibiotics are misused or overused in animals, it causes a selective pressure of certain bacteria populations by killing the susceptible bacteria, thereby allowing only the resistant bacteria to survive, then they will multiply. Um, selective pressure negatively impacts on human health, resulting in increased human morbidity, mortality, um, reduced efficacy of these antibiotics to work. When people are sick, they no longer can cure the infection. Um, increased healthcare cost longer hospital stays due to the treatment failure and increased um, potential for dissemination of these um, superbugs spreading from one host to the other or in the environment or along the food chain. In 2005, um, based on the recommendation of the tripartite um, that FAO that's the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, and the World Health Organization, WHO developed a list of critically important antimicrobials for human health. <laughs> the World Organization for Animal Health, usually previously known as OIE, also did the same for animal health. So it's been projected that this problem <laughs> will increase in um, low and middle income countries because of the high demand for meat um, to meet the growing population and this will force farmers to use more antibiotics in food animal production. Many countries like Nigeria do not have strict regulation for access of antimicrobials, hence the indiscriminate use of antimicrobials in food animals, especially poultry. You'll agree with me that you can just walk into the market and ask for any antibiotics and it will be sold to you without any prescription. That's what obtains in Nigeria. So what were the objectives of this study? One, to you know identify and characterize E. coli that we uh, obtained from cattle at slaughter in two abattoirs Abucha in, in, in Abucha and Lagos to describe the susceptibility patterns, to determine the prevalence in these different species, and then to determine the risk factors for being colonized with these bacteria in abattoir workers. So this study was carried out in the two largest abattoirs in Lagos and Abuja, highlighted in green. Um, it was a cross-sectional study from March 2020 to April, August 2021. And our study populations were human and cattle, including our environmental samples. Um, we used um, simple random sampling to select our population 
we also calculated our sample size to be 422 for this study. We collected 448 samples comprising 58 environmental samples, 118 stool samples from abattoir workers, 272 sickle samples from slaughtered cattle. We isolated bacteria using culture. We confirmed it using commercial kits and performed antimicrobial susceptibility testing using the Kebibaldi's deficient method. We defined multidrug resistance as resistance to three or more classes of antimicrobials. We performed whole genome sequencing on all the isolates, as well as in silico detection of resistance genes, plasmid typing, in silico multi local sequence typing. MLST using schemes by Ackerman, which considered a leg variation among seven housekeeping genes to assign sequence types. And then we use phylogenetic tree to determine the genetic relatedness of the isolate using a snipped based um, technique. And then we visualize this tree using the ITOL tool. We obtained ethical approval for this research. And all our respondents were given an informed consent form telling them the purpose of the study, which was signed prior to sample collection. We collected data on social demographics and exposure factors using a structured interviewer administered questionnaire that we had installed on a, um, on a smartphone. We analyzed our data using um, univariate, bivariate, and multivariate analysis. So ladies and gentlemen, here are our results. Out of the 448 samples that we collected, 215 were positive for E. coli, out of which 97 of them were characterized as extended spectrum beta lactam um, E. coli. Of the 118 abattoir workers that we interviewed, a majority were males. They were above 41 years old. They were married and they had Islamic education. They lived in urban areas and were mostly butchers. Antimicrobial susceptibility testing showed us that all the isolates were susceptible to cholestine, kefoxetine, imipenem, and meropenem. They're not listed on this slide. But majority of the E. coli isolates were resistant to tetracycline, as you can see on the slide with the highest um, bar and then ampicillin respectively. This is ampicillin, the next one. So this figure shows that the various, the shows the various occupational groups at the abattoir comprising of butchers, cleaners, veterinarians, meat sellers, and the likes. A majority of the E. coli isolates were recovered from butchers, followed by the abattoir cleaners, and then the meat carriers. Only um, very few salmonella were recovered. That's why the focus is not on salmonella, just on E. coli. And the prevalence of E. coli colonization among the butchers was 65.1%. So this slide shows us that um, E. coli belongs to 52 known sequence types. The most prevalent ones were um, sequence type 10, sequence type 4, 6, 8, 4, 2, 1, 7, 8, and sequence type 58, as you can see. It's across human, um, no, this environment, cattle, and human. So these three were across, were shared between the three interfaces. So this slide shows the association between work exposure factors and being colonized with multidrug resistant E. coli. If someone was aged um, over 41 years and, you know, washing their hands, we saw there was a statistically significant um, relationship or association at bivariate analysis. We can also see that keeping animals at home, eating in the abattoir while, you're, while they were working and collecting abattoir waste also were associated with being colonized with multidrug resistant E. coli. 
So after we control for our potential confounders, as we can see, one of our confounders is gender, because most of the workers were males from our findings. We removed gender in our, our we took control of that in our analysis and using our own conditional logistic regression model, we use the stepwise me method to take out the risk factors that were resist, um, significant and bivariate and then added them one by one into the model. And we found out that our independent risk factors that remained statistically significant after all this was done was age, being over 41 years old, keeping animals at home, eating in the abattoir, collecting abattoir waste, and washing hands with soap. So the risk factors were the first four because that's what puts you at risk of being colonized. And then washing hands with soap was found to be protective. So if you washed your hands with soap and clean water, you were found to be protective. So this phylogenetic tree shows us um, the ESBL E. coli visualizing the interactive tree of life tool. So this tree was rooted in a reference E. coli strain. The isolates were clustered um, along their phylogenetic groups, very tiny. If you look here, these are the phylogenetic groups A, B, one B2, D, and E. So they were grouped along those lines. You could see that this column stands for the phylogenetic grouping. You could see most of them clustered along this. They were in the, the majority were B1. And then um, the, the resistant phenot um, genotypes, these are the resistant genes. And then these are the plasmids in brown. The, the orange colors are the absence. So this is present. And then this is absent. And then these are the mobile genetic elements. So the majority of the ASBL extended spectrum beta lactam E. coli gene that we detected was blasted to the XM15. And you can see that most of them had blood. It's along this line, most of them had it. So if it's light pink, it's not there, but if it's dark pink, it's there. So for, um and mentioned the sequence type that we had, and then mentioned that these isolates were kind of related because the phylo groups were the same. They had identical sequence type. They had similar antimicrobial resistant genes. They had similar plasmids and mobile genetic elements. So this um, phylogenetic tree is just emphasizing that we had isolates from humans and cattle that were closely related. Um, if you look down here, you'd see that this is this particular isolate and this one is from cattle and this one is from human. They had the same um, they had the same ESBL gene. They had identical and the rest of the resistant genes were similar for both. They had the same plasmids. They had the same virulence genes. And they had the same sequence type. So this is the key here for you to know that they were both ST58. These two were both ST215, although there were some variances with this one, but these two were very closely related with a difference of two SNPs apart. So they had identical, I mentioned all of that. So what did we conclude? Um, we concluded that people that work in the abattoir or people that work closely with animals, they are at risk, occupational risk exists for them. And people that are quite apparently healthy could harbor and shed multidrug resistant E. coli in their stool. So this is a public health issue. When people present in the hospital, you want to find out where they work, whether they in close contact with animals to help you in making a good diagnosis. So when you're comparing, these people are more at risk than the general population for this type of resistant bacteria. So it's good when doctors are collecting their patients. So also take this into consideration. Um, where do you work so that you can make a good sense, your good judgment? Um, the prevalence was highest among butchers, as we saw in the data that I presented, and. The risk factors were obviously obvious. They were exposure to animals at home, eating 
available so when you're walking of course your hands are dirty there's tendency to get your food contaminated and you're taking the bacteria so the chances are high then those that collect the waste of course if they don't wear personal protective equipment like their gloves like their gowns they are also at risk and then graciously washing your hands with soap and water as simple as it sounds does a lot of magic because it gets rid of the bacterial load on your hands and protects you from being infected or colonized with these resistant bacteria. So it's of importance that we, you know, pay attention to hand washing. And then we also were able to, sh to show you that there is a possibility of horizontal gene transfer from cattle to humans. Although we can't prove the direction, whether it was the cattle that were infecting the humans or the humans that were infecting the cattle, but there was definitely a transfer of resistance because we could see from the data that I presented that they had just two snips apart. That's very close. So based on our findings, we recommended to the government to organize regular AMR awareness programs. So kudos to your group for putting this together. A lot of people are not aware. The awareness level is very low in the country. That's why a lot of people still do what they do. Um, develop and enforce AMR regulations across sectors is important that we regulate the use of drugs um, because people can, anybody can walk into a pharmacy and ask for any kind of antibiotics in Nigeria and it to be sold to them without a doctor's prescription. That's not good. Encourage hand, hand, hand hygiene and responsible use of antibiotics among the workers. Discourage easy access to antibiotics used in food producing animals. I've been to the market where I see that the Fulanis or the house of people that sell chickens just go to the pharmacy, buy tetracycline, put it in water and give chickens to drink. And then people go to the market and buy these chickens and then, you know, yeah. The, the drugs is even still in the tissue and then the chicken is slaughtered and they take it home. So there's easy access. This should be discouraged. Encourage, um, the, the government should encourage that people get prescription before they purchase these antibiotics. And then also to encourage farmers to promote biosecurities on their farms. If the animals are not sick, there won't be any need for you to use antibiotics. So basic hygiene on the farm, basic biosecurity measures can prevent diseases from getting into the farm. So if the animals are not sick, then there won't be need to use antibiotics and promote also the use of probiotics, which are available now, uh, bacteriophages and other alternatives to antimicrobials. I think this is the end of my talk. So I'd like to acknowledge the following organizations for their support and collaboration towards this study. This work has been published, so it's freely, freely available. Um, it's if you type in that link, I'm sure you'd find it on the net. And that's my contacts. Thank you for your attention. I'm Thank happy you to so take much, any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Marvel. That was amazing. And Sean, but detail. Thank you so much. So if you have any question, kindly raise up your hand in the chat box or you type it out in the chat box. I'll be in the chat box to read the questions. If you have any question, you can unmute or you write it out in the chat box. If people get to, you know, maintaining good hygiene, then most of these problems will be solved. But we don't tend to remember that and we tend to think medicine will always cure the problem. Most times the medicine will take complicated issues for us and cause problems ahead because most of these antibiotics now are no longer working. You can imagine you need to use third generation drugs to cure a particular infection that first generation, they are first line cephalosporins, but they are no longer working because when people go to the pharmacy, the pharmacist gives you what you, the, the chemist or the drug shop, they don't know what you need it for because they're not the doctors. And the, we always encourage that in hospitals before doctors prescribe, any antimicrobial they need to do what we call antimicrobial susceptibility testing because sometimes you you collect a sample you have to know whether the antibiotics you are going to use to treat is the right one otherwise you'll just be compounding problems so most times doctors do try and error 
because they've collected samples. You don't want the patient to die, so you want to do something. You've collected the patient's sample, you send it to the lab. The lab is wasting time. They're not bringing out the result. The doctor will prescribe something. Sometimes the doctor will tell you to watch the treatment. If you don't get better, come back. So maybe by the time you come back, your, your lab results would have been out. Oh, the antibiotic they prescribed before was not the correct one. And then they changes. All these things have implication for the organism that they are trying to treat. And then for the good bacteria that is in the gut, they also have implications because this bacteria can acquire resistance and become harmful in the Any future. Advice, okay. So I hope I was able to do justice to that question. I hope I did. Um, I'm seeing another question in the chat. Am I supposed to read the questions in the chat or someone is supposed to read them? Okay, so someone is saying, um, was this my doctoral research? No, this was not my doctoral research. This was, this was a project that was um, funded by the Fleming Fund. Um, Nigeria got support from the Fleming Fund and they wanted to um, help, they wanted us to, they wanted to support the government of Nigeria to, you know, kind of set up a surveillance system. So this was like a pilot to see what will work um, for our AMR surveillance system. That's why this work was done. It's just to help us understand what's happening at our slaughterhouses and see how government can have a surveillance system. Because surveillance is ongoing, continuous, collection of data for public health action. So you keep collecting data, you keep analyzing it. And then based on the information you get from the data you collect, you make decisions. If your policies were not working before, based on your new findings, you modify your policies and see how they work better. So that's the essence of surveillance. So this was supposed to be like a pilot to um, get the ball rolling. But right now, I don't know where the government is with this, but this was a support from Fleming Fund. It was UK government that funded this, like supporting Nigeria for that. Um, someone else is asking, um, I observed extensive use of antibiotics in animal husbandry. This is, they insist that it's essential for animals growth and survival at the alternative. Okay, so it's in the mindset. In many countries, they don't use antibiotics anymore in production. So it's our mindset that, oh, I've spent so much money buying these chickens. If I don't give them antibiotics, they would die. That's not true. Ordinary hygiene, provide good hygiene on your farm. But that's what we call biosecurity. Prevent, that's preventing diseases from getting into your farm. Ordinary hygiene, as, in, as simple as hygiene is. Put a dip in front of your farm. Don't allow people to drive in their vehicles into your farm. Put a dip in front of the pen where the chickens are. Make sure you dip your feet into the disinfectants in the dip before you go in. Disinfect your shoes. Make sure you don't keep chickens at home and then come to work in someone else's farm. Because if you have chickens at home, if your chickens have diarrhea, there's everything else you are going to bring that diarrhea to the farm and infect the chickens on the farm. So... There are many rules. There are many rules in biosecurity. Make sure you have a lab um, and overall. So what most ideal farms do is you should have a shower at the entrance of your farm. So where you're coming from your house, paraventure you have a farm at home and you're coming to work in someone else's farm, the person should have like a shower at the entrance. So when the person gets into the farm, the first thing is the person showers, changes their clothing, remove the clothes they brought from home, the shoes, everything they brought, cover their hair with hair cover, wear you know, their overall, wear their boots, then they are clean to go into the farm. That way they'll protect the chickens from whatever it is they brought from their house. They've already taken it off. So they go into the farm clean, they take care of the chickens, they feed them. They don't need antibiotics. There are places where they do organic. Nothing like, and even in Nigeria, in, in Abuja, there are people that raise chickens without antibiotics. So it's in the mindset, and that's why we need to start doing awareness. It's possible to raise chickens without giving them any form of antibiotics. But because farmers are scared, but one, some farmers don't have money to pay veterinarian. So you say, oh, I don't have money to pay vet. Vet will charge me so much money. So you go to the market and buy what you think you want to give your chickens. And foolishness, you, you give them antibiotics, you load them with antibiotics, and think that that would solve the pro prevent them from falling sick. Well, then the people that eat the eggs from that farm are consuming antibiotics that they don't need. The people that eat the chickens from that farm are consuming antibiotics that they don't need. So you see where the E. coli in your gut is getting some resistance from. Because you eat eggs that already contain tetracycline. You eat um, chicken um, that, has already that already contains amp ampicillin. Why would the E. coli in the gut develop resistance? Because you are giving, you are taking drugs, you don't need them. So in, 
your chicken, you are eat, taking drugs in your eggs, you are taking drugs because some farmers somewhere, they are doing the wrong thing. They are pumping the chickens with the, with the antibiotics. So the thing is coming out in the products. Ideally, when you treat an animal, there's what we call withdrawal period. You allow, for some drugs is seven days, for some drugs is 14 days. So as you treat the animal, it's expected that you don't take the products within seven days. Like if the animal is producing milk, for example, cow, when you milk the cow for that seven days that is on antibiotics, you throw away the milk. Nobody should drink that milk because the milk will be loaded with antibiotics. Every, the body will break it down, take what it needs and send the rest out. And that is coming out in the milk. So anybody that's drinking that milk is taking little doses of antibiotics, even when they're not sick. Tell me now what happens when the person is sick. The same drugs we use to treat animals are the same composition that are human medication. Tetracycline in, 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 in veterinary medicine, the same as tetracycline in human medicine. The only difference is the packaging. The chemical content is the same. So if you have taken tetracycline in your meat and you need tetracycline to work for you and it doesn't work, don't blame the drug for not working or say that doctor doesn't know what it's with. It's because you have taken little doses of it from milk, from eggs, from all other sources that veterinarians or, or farm owners are doing. So the whole idea is we're trying to discourage use. There are other ways. Hygiene is number one. During COVID, was it not hygiene that saved most people? Wash your hands, wear your mask. Don't, you know, anywhere you go just so that you protect the next person. Did it not work? It works. Then vaccination. In animal, in animal health, we have vaccines that protect against diseases. So vaccinate the animals. Why pump them with antibiotics? So there are other methods. It's just that people just feel that's why there should be awareness. Most people don't know. If they know, I'm sure they will not do otherwise. And if they know that one day they can be in hospital and not recover from that sick bed and eventually die. It's, it's happening. People have long-term diseases. They, can't, they are stuck in hospital paying bills. They can't discharge them because... They are not getting better. They are not getting better because the drugs are not working. Why are the drugs not working? Because of resistance. So that's just, it, it's not a, it's a silent killer. Like WHO has said, it's a worse crisis than AIDS because it's a silent killer. You, they keep giving you one drug, it doesn't work. Then they will change to a stronger antibiotic. Then it doesn't work. Then they change it to a much stronger antibiotic. I'm sure if you've talked with people, you'll find out that there are people that have stories like that, that man, they gave me one very strong antibiotic because the ones that should have cleared the thing did not work. Why are they not working? The pathogens have developed, you know, they, we call them superbugs. They've developed tick. Like when I, I did one, I did some videos on YouTube and I was trying to break down to microbial resistance to a language that people will understand. And I said, when the, 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 the gems don't develop tick body, yes, yeah, something like that, you know, nothing you do will happen. It won't work because they have, over time there's exposure, exposure over time. And that's what develops the, the, the selective pressure. And that's what we're saying. I mentioned it at the beginning of my talk. I talked about selective pressure in bacterial population because of misuse, overuse, abuse of these antibiotics. And at the end of the day, it translates to high morbidity in humans, high mortality. They will know, they will stay in hospital to eventually the person will die. Then, um, what do you call it? Um, the treatment failure. They will give you an antibiotic that should work and it will not work. And then I result in treatment failure. So longer hospital stays, people will be there admitted. They will not be discharged because of this issue. So it's something that we should find a way to, you know, um, communicate to our audiences. And I like this opportunity. I like the fact that um, you guys have, have this platform to, you know, share knowledge. Um, how I wish the laboratory workers would have yet put the you see it's small, small. There's behavioral change is difficult. We are human beings. We don't like change. It's what we're used to that we like to do. In fact, when you go to the abattoir, they will, you will see them as they are killing the animal. They will cut some part and just throw it inside the animal. They say, ah, you see, you know, this one, no, they kill. That's when you tell them, so they say something we kill somebody one day. So, you know, it's our mindset, something we kill somebody one day. So they don't care. But then if you put a wash station, wash hand station, put a basin, put soap, put, you know, small, small, you, you know, you go and wash your hands, small, small, people will be, it's small, small, it's gradual, you know, overnight, people don't change overnight. So it's small, small, and someone needs to demonstrate it. 
And then over time, people will start changing their behavior as a gradual thing. And before you know it, many people will start doing it. So as simple as washing your hands with soap, it is very effective. Um, in addition to that, most of these farmers do not have money to build. Biosecurity is not hard. What did I say is biosecurity? Preventing disease from entering your farm. Ordinary deep. I go to, I go to farms and what do I see people do on the farms? They will put, the dip is like a, you make a hole, kind of a four corner hole in front of the cemented, in front of the pen, and you pour um, disinfectant in it, right? So the idea is you need to dip your shoes in that before you enter the poultry pen. Many farms I go to, the thing is dry, no disinfectant inside, it's just for decoration. So you, you might not have the money to build a shower, to, but at least if you have lab coats, you tell your people, please wear lab coats when you come. Make sure when you get to the farm, the shoe you brought from your house, don't wear that shoe inside my farm. Get them boots so that as you are getting to the farm, they are taking off their shoes from the house. Because the problem is if the person has chickens at home and the person has the chickens in the house have avian influenza, for example, if the person comes to the farm from that house that he has chickens, it's going to infect the chickens on the farm. So the only way to protect that investment is to make sure whatever, whether they, are, they have chickens, it's not your business. But before you enter the farm, please remove the shoes you wore when you came from your house. Wear an overall over your clothes so that whatever was on your clothes does not jump at the chickens. Because the four mites, the hair, the body, your clothes, your shoes, that's where um, germs stick to. Uh, you can introduce into the farm and then the chickens get infected so you don't want that to happen so just basic then don't share equipment between farm a and farm b make sure you don't share make sure you don't have reservoirs of you know pathogens on your farm then another thing that we discovered is one way that diseases spread you know from farm to farm is these people that that sell eggs these people that sell eggs go from farm to farm so we advise farmers don't allow these people that sell eggs to come into your farm as simple as that is because if they've been to 10 farms that have problems they're bringing all the problems to your farm and it's their shoes and their clothes as innocent as they look they are the disease spreaders and then they put the farmer in trouble farmer was just saying all of a sudden my chicken started dying it didn't just start dying like, who did you let into your farm Maybe the person selling eggs he has roamed around how many farms. You don't know where they are coming from, what has happened in those farms. And then they bring it to that farm. So that's one. Two, so the people that remove manure from farms are also guilty. They take the manure, they take it to fish farms. They take it to whatever they use manure for, vegetable farms and all that. So what we advise farmers to do is bag your manure when you want to. Those that do deep litter, bag your manure, put it in bags, put it in front of your farm we advise farmers to fence their farms you know as as simple as it is it's, it works fence your farm and put no entry at the door that's simple and and then monitor the people that go in and out of it of the farm that will save you a lot of money because once people don't some people use their farm as show off for show off oh come and see my farm i have chickens you are in, inviting trouble People should not go in. It should not be where people go in and out of. It's only people that work there. And people that work there should have the right clothing, at least boots. You want to, you, if you can buy chicken and build a house for chicken, you should be able to buy boots and lab coats for the people that work on that farm. That is basic to protect that investment and then not allow free traffic into, in and out of the farm. And um, what else? What else am I seeing here? Um, um, okay, in addition to that most of these farmers, okay, I've seen that. <laughs> okay, let's see, okay. <laughs> so yeah, long and short is awareness. This thing you're doing is very good, but take it to the people that need it. You know, that's why I, I thought about how, how else to communicate. I did videos in, in English, I did in Yoruba, I did in Hausa, I posted it on YouTube. And then maybe I'll revive those videos again and recirculate them so that people can hear. And, you know, as basic as information is, is power. You know, you don't need antibiotics. Antibiotics are wasting money that you could have saved. All those antibiotics are not cheap. You buy them, at the end of the day, you're causing more harm to people that eat the products that come from. And then the way the world is going now, gradually, people will not eat. <laughs> if they know you use antibiotics on your chicken, nobody will buy your chicken. 
going, we are moving there gradually because people are be becoming wiser. That, oh, there's organic. Oh, what is organic? You're not using anything artificial. And the chickens live long. See, when they, they need to be stored. So what are those people that are doing organic doing? In Kuje, in Abuja, there's organic chicken farm. So if people, and he has his customers and they pay more for the chickens because it's, organic is not easy, but they pay more. And people are ready to pay more to buy the organic chickens and buy chicken that you know that there's antibiotics in. You know, who wants to die? You know, so everybody, people are getting wiser and it's, it's awareness. So as we spread this news, I'm sure gradually people will start thinking, like me and you think about what we are eating, thinking about where we, where we are shopping. I can choose. I'm not buying any chickens from Wuse Market because I go to Wuse Market in Abuja and I see that, oh, they just open. You just see the guy, the malam that is selling the chicken. They don't open it as I clean for some of them. I say, this one, I be like, say, one day. So they open it. There's someone comes, oh, that one. Okay, I want to buy that one. The guy just loaded those chickens in the recycling. Then you point at it, point and kill. The guy to slaughter the chicken for you with fresh tetracycline in the tissue. Then you go home, yummy, yummy. You eat the chicken loaded with tetracycline that has not been processed at all. The body has not even started any work. You load it and then problems. So that's how you take some optimal doses of these drugs. And then when you need the drugs to work, they no longer work. So yes, I would give, I'll give my, I'll send, give the PDF of the presentation to, um, but you have the publication is out there. I've published it. Is in, maybe I should look for the, I've published it. So it's freely available and it's better to read the full paper because the slides were just a summary. The full, the full paper would, let me see if I can pull it out. The full paper would, will give you more gist than this one, this is summarized. This is summarized for this talk. So the full paper, let me see. I think, yes, I'm going to put the link in the chat so that as many as are interested in accessing it, you can just download the full paper and, you know, read it. That you have everything in there from start to finish. And that gives you um, an idea. It's a when drug resistant bacteria are transmitted from Farm animals to human or vice versa are the diseases cause yes. Yes, E. coli, for example, is a zoonotic, is a zoonotic bacteria. I said that at the beginning of my talk. It can be transmitted from human to animal and from animals to human. That's the definition of zoonosis, diseases that you know are shared between humans and animals. It's either the humans are the ones giving the animals or the animals are giving the humans. And I showed you from my talk that. Cattle and, and, and humans were exactly what was happening in the, in the cattle. They isolate from the cattle and the humans very closely related. What does that tell you? But, you know, we need to keep speaking this gospel. We need to keep sharing this message so that, you know, as many people as can hear, it's, this is a time bomb. Share COVID came and put all of us in. Antibiotic resistance is a time bomb waiting to explode. And the funny thing is, it's a global problem because people can, people move from, today you are in Abuja, tomorrow you are in London. You can have a resistant bacteria and then carry it to London. And then the problem again is some people don't even have difficult situations before they go to the hospital. They go to the hospital and because the doctors were careless, they got resistant bacteria. And then they, they stayed in the hospital. Maybe they went for a small thing that could, you know, could have been cured they now got a resistant bacteria bug in the hospital because we have what we call uh, hospital acquired infections. It's from the hospital because you went to the hospital, then you get the bug because it, it, maybe a doctor saw a patient that they are managing and the patient is not recovering and then didn't do the needful, you know, didn't wash his hands um, with soap, didn't, you know, or didn't wear gloves. Ideally, before a doctor sees a patient, he should wear gloves. When he's done with that patient, he should take off his gloves, at least basic um, universal precautions, take off his gloves and wash his hands before he sees another patient. Now he sees a patient and then he goes to see another patient. And that's how he infects that patient that didn't have any business with resistant bacteria. They now owner has resistant bacteria and they cannot, and cannot be cured. And sometimes they die because of someone's carelessness. So these things are real. Even in newborn babies, in, in um, ne neonatal the babies that Nico, where you have newborn babies that, you know, you sh the place should be neat and, you know, very hy hygienic, very sterile. Just one resistant bug enters that place. All the babies are gone. 
that is how bad this is. And I um, mean, they need for us to see how we can spread the word. And, you know, yes, nosocomial infections. Yes, you're right. We should see how we can spread the word. This thing is real, it's a time bomb. And the more awareness we create, the better for us as a people and as a country and help us. We should be preaching behavioral change. Don't be the doctor of yourself. When you are sick, go to the hospital. When you get to tell them to do tests before they give you any drug, be ready to pay for Some people don't want to pay for the test. That's the problem. And uh, antimicrobial susceptibility is expensive. So when you do that, say, we are charging you for lab. Hey, I'm not paying lab. Just tell me the drug that I should go and buy. That is another problem. Because when they do susceptibility, spending wise pound foolish. When they do the susceptibility testing, if it was tetracycline that will cure you and they gave you augmentin, there is no way augmentin will cure you until you take tetracycline. And there's no way you will know that tetracycline is the drug of choice until you do susceptibility testing. So when you do susceptibility testing, some, some organisms are already, they have uh, drugs that they're already resistant to. So you can imagine them giving you a drug that the organism is already resistant to, which will never work. And that's because somebody did not do susceptibility testing. So as minute as susceptibility testing is, we encourage that doctors always, you know, send samples to the lab before you prescribe. Yes, the patient needs to get some relief, but antibiotics should not be your first drug of choice. Wait for the results from the lab, then prescribe so that what you're prescribing works. And please, when they prescribe, take your drugs for five to seven days. Please take it for five to seven days. If you take it for two days and you feel better and you don't complete that treatment, you're also causing problems for the future. So these are little, little things that we do that we can preach to people. Yes, make sure you finish your medication. Make sure you see a doctor when you're sick. Make sure you get a prescription before you go to the pharmacy. Don't go and just say, I beg, give me augmented. Then I'll jam it with erythromycin. Then I'll jam it with ciprofloxacin. That's the problem. So I think I've done justice to all the questions I saw in the chat. I've sent you my publication. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's, oh, fish pond. Yes, so fish pond too. Point and kill, that's, those fishes are loaded, those catfish are loaded with antibiotics. They pour it in the water. Then they put the fishes there. Then people come and say, hey, I like that one, I like that one, yeah. A point, then they kill it for you if you go on with <laughs> Fish farmers, that's their work. They are good with antibiotics. So everything is all about awareness. Every aspect, every aspect, <laughs> every aspect, every aspect. Catfish, yes, go and find out. There are studies already that have shown that most of the catfish joints, the catfish is loaded with antibiotics. Unfortunately, that is the reality. And now that you know, I'm sure you would. I see someone's hand up. Please go ahead. I think... Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ma. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the question that I had to my comments. Um, okay. I'm just interested in knowing uh, the likelihood of these farmers um, in taking up some of the recommendations that you um, came up with, I mean, based on your interactions with them uh, during the study and after mm. the study. Yeah. It starts first. They were, they really on that. You know, what I did in my case was most times when people do research, they don't go back to, um, most times when people do research, they don't go back. Yes, they don't go back to give the people their results. So what I did in my own case, I was very interactive with my, with, with those that participated in my study. I told them that for every sample this, because people don't want to even give you their samples in the first place, but I was, I was able to convince them to give me their samples. So they gave me their two samples, I processed them. And I told them as soon as I have results, I'll bring their results. So as soon as I got results, I took the results back to the laboratory. I said, come and see what's in your stool. Though. Sure, I did it for free. This is what is in your stool. And they were like, eh? You know, and they told others. So more, I, that's how I got more people recruited into my study because those that collected their results told their friends that I see well, I did free tests to see what they said they found in my stool. And you know, more people came and were enrolled. Then when I finished and everything was done, I came back and had a meeting with them. When I found out that just washing your hands with soap would do you a lot of good, I had to tell them. I say, see, this is not about going to hospital. This is not about buying all the plenty, plenty medicine. Just wash your hands with soap. And they say, oh, we should tell government. Our government should come and put wash hand basin for them and put soap and everything. And they wash their hands. So I said, let's start. Demonstration. Wash your hands. 
we do it. We do when we have a, a, a AMR awareness week. We go to the market. We carry buckets and soap and everything, and we put it there. And we there was say, "Come and wash your hands." Somebody come and wash. It. We call the next person. Come and wash your hands. And to demonstrate now. When we start do, during COVID, did people not abide? People abided when they knew that COVID was the same thing. So we are leveraging on the things that have worked for COVID to say, see, oh, these things that work for COVID will also work for AMR. So can we now use these platforms to share this same message? People will hear. You just need to keep saying it and saying it and saying it. And then we had a focus group discussion. We went to a community where, um, and we sat with them. And we had the, you know, when you do focus group discussion, you are with the community members, we had pictures of what will you do when you're sick? And we showed them, they say, they say I'll go to chemists, okay. How many of you have people that are in hospital and are not recovering? Some of them say, ah, I have somebody, the person has been in hospital for months, they are not discharged person. Say, that's it. This, this thing we are talking about is what is causing that person to still be in the hospital. So when you talk to people with stories they can relate with, then they see the need to want to change. Because until someone can relate to what you're saying, the person is not ready to make any change. But the moment the person can relate, oh, this is what killed that person. He was in hospital, he did not recover and eventually died. Uh -huh. this is the thing this is the thing okay so what should i now do this is what you should do like that like that you know and that's how the message spreads so sometimes it's getting champions people that have their own um personal stories that you can relate with oh this happened to this person ah okay so I don't want it to happen to me. So this is what I need to do. So, so gradually people would change. They were ready to change. They just told me that I should come and put you. If I put the wash hand base in there, I put soap and water. They wash their hands. So like that's where to start from. Please go ahead. Oh, me to answer your question. Can I see Esther's hand up? Yeah, good evening. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. No. So um I was curious to know how uh, how consistent are we with these things when we do awareness and then continuation? Because I remember you mentioned that you don't know where um, the federal government was with um, the projects that initiated this um, research. So, and then you were also saying, oh, the, the people you interacted with were saying, bring, uh, bring washing, wash hand, let's do this thing. And, but most of the time, we always see projects start up like this, and then in the long run, it just stops. We don't have anything to do for it. Sorry. Yeah, so thank you for your question. So that's just, um, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So thank you for your question. The thing is, it's twofold. When I collected their samples, somebody paid for the test to be done. Do you still expect person to come and pay to put just a bowl of water for you to wash your hands? So it's it's two ways. We should we need to take responsibility. Now, the, the government that brought the money is not federal government of Nigeria that brought the money. It was UK government that brought the money. And federal government of Nigeria is still waiting for UK to bring more money to continue. That's where we are. That's why at that time, that this was 2021. This is 2023 right now. I do, I don't think we 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 haven't made much progress. That's the truth. We can we haven't made much progress because one thing about the government is it has to be in the budget. If something is not budgeted for, the money doesn't just suddenly show up. So plans are on the way. Efforts are being made. Awareness. The government is trying. They are doing making doing awareness, but it's 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 still small. It's not. It hasn't gone far. Most of the awareness is during the week. Do you understand? It's not like the year-round awareness. Every November, November, it's the second week of November. Yeah. WHO always announces when it's the antimicrobial awareness week. So during the awareness week, ah, you will see everybody will be talking about antimicrobial resistance. On the radio, on the TV, people will do road shows. After that week, my sister, that is the end of the show. So it's people like us that are in active research that keep saying this thing is a problem. Oh, let's do something about it. Africa CDC is doing stuff. Um, yes, but the truth of the matter is it's a big deal and it's expensive. So if it was cheap, maybe if it was easy. So the, the way to go is preventing it rather than cure. 
because to do diagnostics is very expensive. When you go to the hospital, you know now, if you want to do tests, they, when they give you bill for just tests alone, it's usually very expensive. And that's why people are not encouraged to want to do lab tests because the money they will charge them to do lab tests is a lot of money. So you let them go use that money to go and buy the medicine. That's the problem. So it's to change our mindset to say, see, you need that lab test so that you buy the correct medicine. Maybe we should start telling them lab tests would help you to buy the correct medicine because without lab test, you buy the wrong one and you keep buying the wrong one and you not get better. So if you do a lab test, it's expensive. Yes, just pay that money to the lab test. At least you'll know what is wrong with you and you'll know what drugs to use that way. But then the lab tests are expensive. So that's the challenge. So government is making efforts, but you know now all of us need to put our hands together and do our parts. I, I, I work with the government and I did, went ahead to do videos. Nobody sent me. I did videos. I put them on YouTube because I felt people needed to hear. It's not only when we have antimicrobial awareness week that we should spread the word. During antimicrobial awareness week, the government goes to markets, goes to fish mar farms, fish markets, goes round those road shows, everything, just to create awareness. But it doesn't last. It's within that time frame, and that's it. But this has to be continuous for us to move forward. Um, I'm seeing more questions in the chat. Uh, okay, UK. Is even interested? <laughs> yes, now UK is interested because the global problem. Don't you understand? Everybody's interested in AMR because the global. I, you can have one resistant pathogen in Nigeria now, now, and in the next minute you're on the plane, you land in London, if you get to their hospital, there's problem for them. So they have to come and help us. Since we don't want to help ourselves, they think helping us will help us solve solve a problem that will. It's it's global. Then what else? Another reason we need, well, okay, as policymakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there are plenty of problems. Nigeria has plenty of problems. So this is just one of the problems. And if the leaders don't see this as a problem, they won't, they won't put money there. Um, what else? At least COVID taught us a lesson. So I wanted, I want to believe that with COVID, nobody knew COVID would hit anywhere now, but COVID suddenly happened and it showed everybody the purpose. So structures have been put in place. Let's just allow those structures to work for AMR because the same structures that worked for COVID are the same structures that work for AMR. We preach, go and take COVID, COVID vaccination. For AMR, most of the diseases that, that are causing resistance, there is, there, is, uh, there is vaccinations for them, like tuberculosis, for example, vaccinate your children, give them their TB stuff. Otherwise, they will have TB later. And TB is a drug resistance issue because over time the, the the pathogens become resistant and then the treatments are no longer working so, so for some of these problems there is vaccine it's just that are people taking their vaccinations and all of that then hygiene and all of that so yes i think i've said most of the things <laughs> i can't i can't fix everything but you people are trying I, I i salute your courage putting this together but take the message spread it talk to people it starts from you. The change begins, change begins with me. So you start from your house and then it spreads to the schools. It spreads to the markets everywhere. Before you know it, everybody will be washing their hands with soap and water and then we'll be reducing the body. It, and you know, that works for most diseases. So it's not just AMR, for most diseases that works. And like I said, even the farms, if they can just embrace hygiene, day two they won't need antibiotics for growing the chickens and the and all that they don't need it we don't need growth promoters in fact navdac has banned the use of antibiotics as growth promoters but still some people smuggle it and still give the chickens they say it will make the chicken grow which grow we don't need it you don't need growth promoters to make sure your chickens are healthy so it's just in our mind and let's keep spreading the word and i'm sure i think um our time is up and yeah my email is in my email okay i can put my email so for further communication you can always mail me um so, uh, okay we, yeah let me put my email in there yeah you're welcome so i, I can respond to the email yeah okay um is there anyone again who has question anyone else I think Dr. Mabel did, did justice to everything. Even if um, an illiterate who doesn't know anything about um, E. coli before, I'd listen to her. The person definitely will go back home filled with knowledge. 
Thank you so much, Doctor, once again. Thank you very much. Nice having me.